Research uh, by the World Values Survey showed that by the time Modi came to power in 2014, some 56% of Indians were supporting rule by a strong leader. There have been recent Pew surveys which show that India is one of the, I think, four countries where a majority of citizens, which is 53%, say that they would rather support military rule. So yes, there. So there has been a, a growing appetite for a strong man. I'm Seraphine Danani, legal fellow of Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare podcast, April 10th, 2023. On March 23, 2023, an Indian court found Prime Minister Narendra Modi's principal opposition leader Rahul Gandhi guilty for defaming the Prime Minister and the Modi surname. He was sentenced to two years in prison and expelled from parliament in what journalists and pro-democracy groups view as yet another inflection point of democratic decline under Modi's leadership. To understand the challenges facing Indian society and the current deterioration of India's democracy, I sat down with Debashish Roy Chaudhary, Indian journalist based in Hong Kong and Kolkata, who's written extensively on Indian politics, society, and geopolitics. He's co-authored a book titled To Kill a Democracy, India's Passage to Despotism, in which he paints a chilling history and reality of the state of Indian democracy. We discuss the Rahul Gandhi case, the spillover of Hindu nationalism into mainstream politics under Modi's leadership, and the future of India's democracy. It's the Lawfare Podcast, April 10th, India's Democracy Under Modi. So... I admittedly don't quite know where to start here. And I think part of the problem is that India under its current prime minister, Narendra Modi, hasn't received much attention from the United States media, at least I would say not in proportion to Prime Minister Modi's impact on India and India's democracy. So perhaps one place we can start is the events from about two weeks ago where Indian opposition leader to Prime Minister Modi, Rahul Gandhi, was sentenced to two years in prison for defamation and in turn was expelled from parliament. Explain to us who Rahul Gandhi is and what he did that was so defamatory that led to this two-year sentence and then expulsion from parliament. Okay, uh, so Rahul Gandhi is the uh, leader of the Congress Party. Congress Party is the uh, oldest political party in India. It's the grand old party of India, uh, 137 years old, if I'm not mistaken. It is the party which led India to independence and dominated Indian politics for half a century after that. And um, he comes from a very political family. His father was a prime minister. His grandmother was a prime minister and um, his mother was the president of of the party, the Congress party. And um, uh, his great grandfather was a prime minister too. So uh, was the first prime minister of India. So this is the famous Nehru Gandhi family, which uh, members of which have ruled India for much of its independence. Now, Rahul Gandhi, uh, under in the last 10 years, uh, the Congress party has lost its preeminence in Indian politics. And Rahul Gandhi has of late been trying to, trying very hard to revive a very quickly shrinking political Congress party. So what happened with the Rahul Gandhi in a couple of weeks ago, as you mentioned, is that in 2019, while campaigning for national elections, he made a joke about people with the last name Modi being thieves. He cited some fugitive tycoons and and the prime minister himself as examples. Now, a politician from uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's BJP party, who is also son named Modi, filed a criminal complaint in response accusing Rahul Gandhi of defaming the entire Modi community. So last month what happened is the court finally ruled on the matter 
convicting Rahul Gandhi of criminal defamation and sentencing him to two years of jail. Uh, Rahul Gandhi had 30 days to appeal to a higher court against the verdict, during which time the verdict would not be implemented. But the parliament, which is controlled by Modi's party, uh, which has the maximum seats in the house, moved at breakneck speed to expel Rahul Gandhi from parliament within a day of the court ruling. Uh, so I think you were talking about that, this incident two weeks ago, and which was a shocker because they were basically expelling the most important leader of the opposition from the parliament of India. He was expelled from parliament under what law? So this defamation, criminal defamation, he was sentenced to two years of jail term. Now, two years in prison happens to be the minimum penalty that automatically renders a sitting member of parliament ineligible for office for eight years. So like whatever crime you do, if you have uh, been sentenced to two years and you are an MP, you your seat will automatically go and you will be expelled from parliament and you cannot uh, run for office for eight years. So this can apply to any convicted crime by the member of parliament. What I find really striking about this, Debasish, is that it seems like the bar for defamation was quite low. So for example, in the United States, if you're a public figure and someone goes out and says, something defamatory about you, the bar to prove that that was a defamatory statement is quite high. I believe the burden is that the person spoke about you with actual malice. It was intentional. They knew what they were saying was a lie and there was actually damage, like tangible reputational type damage. And that doesn't seem to be the case in India. So what is the defamation law in India? And was it applied correctly in this case? Or was Rahul Gandhi, for reasons unknown, perhaps because he himself is a public figure and, know, and should know better, that he was held to a higher standard? No, you, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, although legal standards for defamation are also very high in India, but what this judgment showed is that it reflects the level of government capture of the judiciary. As, as many legal luminaries have pointed out, criminal defamation requires that the defamation is specifically directed at that person rather than a generic class of people of which the person is a member. So for um, example, if you say that all doctors are crooks, any doctor can't just file a defamation case against you unless she can prove that you specifically called her a crook. This is pretty basic in defamation laws and it is designed that way to keep away frivolous petitions. So obviously the judgment was very problematic, but the judgment also raises questions about the length of the sentence. These two years of imprisonment is the maximum term one can get under criminal defamation in India. And, and it so happens that there are probably no recorded instance of anybody ever getting two years of defamation in India. Now, why is this two years interesting? It's interesting because two years of conviction, of sentencing, is also the minimum to get an MP expelled from the parliament. Like in any case, if you are a sitting MP of the parliament, if you have convicted of a crime and you have been uh, sentenced to two years or more, you automatically lose your seat in the parliament. So well, the fact that it was a ridiculous case and a ridiculous judgment to uh, hold, on top of that, the sentence also was very convenient in that it was just enough to get him expelled from parliament. So this entire episode is the newest sign of the creeping capture of India's democratic institutions under Modi and or the judiciary, particularly the lower judiciary and even sections of the upper judiciary have not been 
immune from that, or from this capture. That's that's fascinating. And to flesh this out a little bit, so all doctors are thieves, the example that you gave, that's not defamation. And in this case, did he say something on the lines of all people with the last name Modi are thieves? Is is that the problem here, that it was a very broad statement? Yeah, exactly. So, so he was on the campaign trail and, you know, he, you say things like that on the campaign trail. And as far as I can sure. remember, he was saying something like, why does it seem like all people with the back uh, with the name of Modi are thieves? Something like that, you know, like it was a half joke. And um, so it's a completely frivolous case to begin with. Why this case is important is that it marks a moment when the Indian government is basically dropping all pretense of democratic function. You know, one of the distinguishing features of the dispensation under Modi is the characterization of uh, rival politicians as enemies of the state rather than people with a different view of how the country should be run. And uh, his government spends a lot of its political capital to delegitimize its political opponents rather than countering them politically. It is done through media propaganda, through uh, engineered social media outrage, political rhetoric, legal maneuvers such as this, and has been done very efficiently so far against many liberal social activists opposed to the Hindu supremacist worldview. Now that this playbook has now been deployed against the most prominent opposition leader in what is called the world's biggest democracy speaks volumes about the crisis of India's democracy. I think this is what makes this case particularly important. And what is the state of India's judiciary today? You talk about government capture. What does that look like? And this seems very important and timely because Rahul Gandhi is appealing the lower court's decision. And there's a question now, of what should we be expecting from the higher courts? The judiciary these days, I would say, by and large, toes the government's line. Uh, some legal experts, in fact, see the rise of what they call the quote-unquote executive court, which is a judiciary that works like an arm of the executive rather than an independent democratic institution. Now, as for Rahul Gandhi, of course, we don't know how this will pan out. Uh, as you know, he has just got a bail and the court will take up the case again on the 13th. But my personal guess is that it might be overturned sooner than later. Uh, or the, or the judgment was so controversial that the higher courts would overturn it anyway because it's just embarrassingly uh, bad. And in any case, I think the message of the government's power has been sent. Modi's base is thrilled and it has had the desired chilling effect on those against his government. You know, like if this is what they can do to Rahul Gandhi, imagine what they can do to a lesser politician or activist. So that is pretty scary. In any case, I think Rahul Gandhi as opposition face is a much safer bet for Modi than the myriad regional parties that are looking to put up a united fight against Modi without the leadership of the Congress. And uh, this is because Modi's party, the entire uh, Hindu right wing, has invested a lot of resources in trivializing Rahul Gandhi in particular. And if there is an opposition led by Rahul Gandhi, then Modi has a known enemy or known face which uh, he can tackle easily. And Rahul Gandhi also comes with a lot of baggage because he comes from this political family which has ruled India for so many years. And one of the resentments that Modi has tapped in successfully is that the Congress has uh, failed India. Uh, India did not meet its promise because of the way it was run for half a century by this family. So Rahul Gandhi comes with a lot of uh, baggage and and they have invested a lot of resources in trivializing Rahul Gandhi as a political leader, as a, as a person who is not fully interested in politics. But it would be more difficult for Modi to 
fight an alliance of opposition leaders with the prime ministerial candidate is an unknown so so he would need a face and an alliance of regional leaders would not have any face so i guess uh, the higher judiciary which as i said these days generally does not cross swords with the government might well conclude that a favorable judgment for rahul gandhi would not aggravate the government at this point and might uh, be happy to uh, let him go before uh, just in time for the election next year that was incredibly fascinating i've never heard that perspective and i haven't read it online either i always thought that the allure of modi was modi himself he reminded me of trump in many ways that folks seem to really support trump because he's trump and that it's the figure that really matters to people but you seem to suggest that if there is an unknown person who opposes modi that there's a chance they have a good shot at you know winning the prime minister seat or or making at least a ripple in indian society so what is the appeal of modi then why, why are people so enamored by him if it's not modi the figure is it that he believes in something that indians are or a chunk of indian population is looking for something in their leader and modi just seems to have it let me give you some numbers right uh, in in 2014 when modi won the election the bjp got 34% of the uh, vote which was cast in 2019 when he was reelected the bjp got 37% of the vote that was cast so for the vote that was cast bear in mind not the total number of voters so if you factor in the abstention of you know like people not voting or not turning up on the election day so average say 30 to 40% people don't vote then the number of people who actually voted for modi was like 20% of the voter base in india now in many countries in the world especially uh, where they have like presidential systems you have to go um, for a runoff uh, if you secure less than 50% of the vote i think the system i'm not fully aware of the system in the us because it's so confusing in the us every four years i have to relearn this whole thing about uh, electoral college and it's very confusing but in many countries like in brazil if you get 49% of the vote then the election has to be i think if i'm not mistaken has to be done again so there is a so you know like 20% of the vote is not a big deal and even of those 20% of the vote many people vote for the bjp because it's the only viable political party around which seems to be prepared and well equipped to run the government so they're not all animated by uh, this animus towards muslims or they are not all in awe of narendra modi the person so there are a lot of factors which keeps uh, bjp winning in many places but obviously not entire india is not all indians uh, are are equally in the mode of modi in fact uh, bjp now rules 16 of the 29 states and of those in six states it did not even win the election it just uh, bribed Uh, opposition politicians to come over to its side so that it could uh, form the government so it's not as hugely popular as we think it is uh, it's just very well managed and uh, its political machinery the or the party machinery functions very well it's very it's a very well greased party uh, machine and uh, unlike other parties but beyond that the appeal of modi uh, would be uh, so he comes across as a man there is a lot of propaganda of course uh, going into pumping up modi like uh, he's this achiever 
uh, his his original appeal was the way he administered Gujarat, uh, the Western state, and and there was this idea that uh, he uh, was business friendly. He knows how to get industry, and Gujarat is one of the most industrialized states in India. Um, so he's business friendly. He's very efficient. I have I have been to Gujarat a few times. I I have to say the cities there they they look very good. They they're very well managed. So there is all that. And then of course his core base of um, Hindu extremism. But they like him for. They see in him as a man who is unapologetically a uh, Hindu supremacist who doesn't make bones about his Hindu supremacism. So I think there are a lot of these factors which go into Modi's popularity. I want to tease out the point about Gujarat. So Modi was chief minister of the state of Gujarat when rioters stormed Muslim-owned properties. I believe it was 2001, 2002, and they slaughtered their Muslim neighbors. And Modi was complicit at best, or at the very least, he absolved himself of his chief minister responsibility, and he didn't crack down on the rioters. Let's put aside the business folks, because I think they're a different bag of worms here. But have his supporters forgotten that history? Because many people have not. And the reason I'm asking is because we're seeing frequent episodes of the same type of violence against Muslims at a much larger scale, not just in Gujarat now, but across India. So what gives? Actually, Modi supporters have not forgotten the 2002 program. They do not worship him despite the riots. They worship him because of the riots. Uh, his supporters love him because they see him as somebody who put Muslims in their place. And or the reason why we continue to see such violence against Muslims across India today is that it is electorally rewarding. And Modi is the ultimate proof of that. You know, like thanks to a rickety judicial system and the lack of political will, people are rarely convicted of mass murder in India. If anything, mass murder are a great way to launch your political career. There are no costs to political violence. So, well, I mean, just last week, a court in Gujarat acquitted all 26 people for offenses ranging from murder to gang rape and rioting because they didn't have enough evidence. Imagine that's a case from 2002. This week, they acquitted, the court acquitted 39 people accused of a massacre of Muslims nearly four decades ago. Again, they were acquitted for the lack of evidence. So mass violence has no deterrent and is proven to have political benefits, which is why we witness frequent episodes of such violence against Muslims and minorities, uh, other minorities across India. It has become a standard tool of political mobilization and advancement of individual political career. Why is there this vilifying the Muslim community in India because there's such a rich history. There was, I mean, I guess depending on who you ask, but regardless, there were there was three centuries of Mughal rule. And then after that, the British took over for a little over half a century. And then India became independent around the 19, 1948, 1950. So when did Muslims become the target? And, and for what reason? No, this is nothing new because in or the, as you know, the independence was accompanied by the partition of India. And there were like large scale violence uh, between riots between Hindus and Muslims. Millions of people died. Millions of people were rendered homeless. People fled their lands and their properties were confiscated. And this happened on both sides. Muslims massacred Hindus, Hindus massacred Muslims. So there is a lot of bad blood. One of the things that you you come across a lot in the propaganda machine of the BJP is that 
that India was this ancient Hindu country, and then uh, the Muslims took a chunk of it as their own. And even after that partition, why do we have Muslims here in India? Because the partition was supposed to, or that partition was done on the religious lines. So, so this is this is one of the one of the propaganda points that that you keep coming across in the Hindu right wing ecosystem. So, uh, I mean, there is a lot of uh, historical baggage in the Muslim relations. This is not entirely new. So what this government has done, what this dispensation has done is they have tapped into these resentments. So unlike others who were hoping that with time these cards of partition will heal, they have actually, they are actually poking at these cards and making it worse because it, it helps them to uh, achieve their goal of a polarized polity and winning elections. So would you say that Modi is responsible for galvanizing Hindu nationalism? As you mentioned, this hasn't gone anywhere. The tensions between Hindus and Muslims, they try to brush everything under the rug, but things are poking out now. Or perhaps is he a byproduct of a growing appetite among many Indians for a strong arm leader? Actually, it's both, uh, I would say. I think Modi is both a symptom as well as the cause of the disease of populist demagoguery. This is basically how neo-authoritarians work. They ride to power on a wave of discontent over the polity and then cripple the polity even more with their passport system politics. Now, you might ask what gives rise to strong men like Modi, what, what can lead to phenomena like Modi. So, I think when people do not have a decent social life in the absence of a meaningful welfare state, and India doesn't have a meaningful welfare state, they do not feel there is rule of law, they feel unrepresented, they do not see themselves living in a fair system, they tend to start losing faith in the political administrative system and or the life of the indignity and powerlessness this breeds push millions of people to take refuge in group identity. So they gravitate towards these strong group leaders who promise to defend them against other groups and they get easily hooked on to the, uh, hooked on this uh, 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 mass opioid of uh, identity politics. This is how democracy begins to lose its appeal and uh, autocrats begin to gain acceptability. So I would say that Modi is galvanizing Hindu supremacism as well as meeting a market demand for strongman politics. Interestingly, Research uh, by the World Values Survey showed that by the time Modi came to power in 2014, some 56% of Indians were supporting rule by a strong leader. There have been recent Pew surveys which show that India is one of the, I think, four countries where a majority of citizens, which is 53%, say that they would rather support military rule. So yes, there. So there has been a, wow. a growing appetite for a strong man, for the reasons that I just explained. And Modi is further galvanizing it by aggressively promoting his cult of personality and his politics of hatred. What's unnerving about Modi is also the breadth of his supporters. So certainly, you have the people you would expect, perhaps those who are impoverished or an older generation that remembers the Gujarat riots, and as you mentioned is voting for him because of a lot of his politics. But what's so fascinating is you also have young, educated urbanites, both in India and also in the United States, who've adopted some of this Hindu nationalism and sympathies, who often I see on Twitter come at Modi's defense whenever there's a social media post, even remotely criticizing 
Prime Minister Modi criticizing India, talking about the erosion of Indian democracy. Talk to us a little bit about what is the appeal of Modi's politics or Hindu nationalism to a young, educated, urban population that typically rejects authoritarianism and thumbs their noses at any sort of religiosity that's permeating into politics? That That is one way of looking at youth, but uh, young, educated, well-to-do urbanites. You know, in India, fall for Modi, I would say the same way uh, educated urban white men fall for white supremacism. So there, there can be many factors that can affect these choices. So indoctrination through mass media is one. That kind of indoctrination feeds uh, long-held resentments against the liberal order. Um, then there is a fear of the enemy, you know, like however constructed, there is this enemy. So in some countries it can be immigrants, in some countries it can be the minorities say, or who already belong to this land. In, in some countries there can be other. So, so there is this fear of the enemy, then um, there is this toxic masculinity, then there is a sense of... Um, entitlement that can blind one to the needs for basic human rights. And I think above all, the certainty and the rootedness that an imagined glorious past provides amid the uncertainty of a rapidly changing present can be cause for attraction to right-wing populism. You know, in, in countries with long histories of colonial occupation or foreign invasions and subjugation, like India, visions of a glorious past and the promise of its reconstruction, this is what the uh, BJP does. It talks about the glorious uh, Hindu civilization 5,000 years ago and, and why uh, we should reconstruct that glorious Hindu rule again in an essentially Hindu country. So these visions of a glorious past and the promise of its reconstruction can um, also easily generate national pride as it evokes a time where the people were last in charge because, you know, like there were these uh, series of invasions, the uh, Muslim rulers, then the British. So people, uh, there is a sense of, there's a inferiority complex which probably grows in you and so well, here comes a man or a kind of politics which talks about the time which was before that before that time when we were in charge and we will make make india that country again so it ought, it it can connect with a lot of people and i don't find it surprising at all populist Ultra nationalism can easily take root in such settings. And for young Indian Americans who you are talking about right now, uh, there could be an uh, additional factor of reconnecting with their roots through nationalism, of feeling pride in their roots, which is also fairly understandable. One, one more thing I would like to add here is that authoritarians are very good at projecting an image of unprecedented accomplishments. If you went by Modi's propaganda machine, all of India's development came after he came to power in 2014. And he's this man taking the country to unimaginable heights with his great work. So which is a subtext of uh, basically all his propaganda, a glorious future awaits India under the able stewardship of Narendra Modi. Now, young people who are naturally more invested in the future than the West are, uh, I, would, I would think, could be more prone to fall for such propaganda. So there is a combination of many factors that can draw even smart young people to authoritarians. So Deb, India calls itself the largest democracy in the world because of its large population size and therefore record number of voters. Before we even get to the question of the state of Indian democracy beyond what you have just shared, Let's start with how you define democracy. So you and a co-author wrote a book 
titled To Kill a Democracy, India's Passage to Despotism. And you write that democracy is a lot more than holding periodic elections. You specify a number of conditions that must be met to have a functioning democracy. What are those conditions? Democracy should be more than studying uh, upper level institutions, uh, institutions such as uh, the judiciary, the legislature, the bureaucracy, etc. This is because uh, high level uh, institutions draw their legitimacy from what we have called in the book social foundations, which is basically the social life of the people. We have focused a great deal on the lived experience of democracy through the lives of people who are at the receiving end of its failures. We have also provided a lot of numbers, a lot of data uh, in trying to quantify these failures. And um, these numbers, these lives, they're meant to capture the true picture of the much vaunted Indian democracy and it's not a pretty picture. For example, we say India has a low intensity famine, which as we know is not compatible with democracies. But the fact is that a third of India's children are stunted because of chronic hunger. Uh, Half the children are anemic. More than 700,000 children under five die every year of hunger. So this all points to um, a shocking level of indignity of life for a large section of the population. But what what we say in the book is that you can have self-government only when people see each other as equals. So if people are ground down by social indignity, they're turned into subjects. You can pretend they're citizens by giving them the right to vote once every five years, but in reality, they aren't. The whole concept of democracy is, is, is predicated on the notion of equality. Of course, we understand. We are all adults here. We understand that perfect equality is, is utopian. But when you have the kind of in-your-face inequality that you see in India, you know, India is today is probably the most unequal country in the world you have to ask yourself if we can really call ourselves a democracy. Because me and you can vote once in five years to elect our government and consider ourselves equals in a democracy. But if we are not even breathing the same air or have access to the same kind of water or have similar life equalizing opportunities such as health or education, can we really call ourselves equal? And if we can't, then are we really living in a democracy? So. The social parameters on which we judge democracy are the access that people have to the most uh, basic ingredients they need for a dignified life. Uh, So we have looked at the quality of healthcare, education, nutrition, quality of work, land, air, water, and even public transport. These are, these are not things that you come across in analysis of democracy, but half of our book is basically on this. And we have simultaneously looked at the quality of India's democratic institutions, such as the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, the media, and like India's social foundations, which have been rotting for decades, even before Modi showed up, we show that Indian institutions have two been serially abused and hollowed out, bringing India to this point in history when its governing architecture is faced with the threat of capture and kill by a demagogue. And if India is not a democracy, Deb, then what is it? It's a very good example of what what a lot of what we have in the book we have called it despotism. Despotism is not to be confused with the despotism of the old. Uh, This is a new kind of authoritarianism which wins the trust of the people. So it kind of wins the willful subjugation of the people. So it has all the trappings of democracy and uh, it uses 
all the organs or all the institutions of democracy it does not dismantle democracy altogether like like dictatorships it doesn't do that it keeps all the structures in place but it captures all the structures and uses them or to create a new form of authoritarianism which is approved by the people so we call it despotism many people call it uh, neo authoritarianism there is another phrase which is competitive authoritarianism so you know like there are different terminologies for this what is the best argument that you've heard in defense of india being a democracy one of the things you will get when you ask people why they think india is a democracy is that uh, people will say that they, india has regular elections um there has been a regular change of power and one of the goals of a democratic system is that uh, it it should be self correcting which means that if you have a regime which is not working for the people the system can correct itself and kick that regime out and bring in a new set of people which has happened in india quite regularly there has been a process of peaceful transfer of power which is yet another goal of democracy uh, which we have also seen in india for 75 years uh, that there has been a peaceful transfer of power all this so these are i would say even even if you ask me i would say if i were to explain why india is a democracy i would i would say that these are the things that uh, make india a democracy and bear in mind uh, all no democracy is perfect and all democracies are a work in progress uh, but despite all its inbuilt problems its frailties uh, india did not become zimbabwe or pakistan or or it, it did not become a dictatorship like uh, most post colonial states so there is a lot to be proud about i mean there can almost be a sense of indian exceptionalism in the way that it has tried to be a democracy but there are all these imperfections which have built up over the decades and i think which have reached a point where which have um, hollowed out the indian state so much that it has become easy for a demagogue to come along and refashion it all together And another argument I often hear in support of India being a democracy, albeit a struggling one at the moment, is it has a very active and rich civil society. So earlier you mentioned this chilling effect that under the Modi regime, many activists, many academics, others might feel who protest the prime minister or the BJP party. and i want to ask you where civil society perhaps the entertainment industry for example and academics fit into all of this like uh, all anti democratic regimes uh, modi's government has clamped down on civil society uh, securing foreign funding has become extremely difficult for ngos as it now depends entirely on the government on who can or cannot attract donations from abroad many prominent civil society figures have been imprisoned on ludicrous charges of sedition think tanks have been wholly domesticated the media has been cowed down uh, with a mixture of uh, inducements uh, intimidation and hostile takeovers by cronies much like orban's hungary much of the hindi and english news channels these days now unabashedly promote modi's party and even spread islamophobic messages when it comes to media well a concerted effort has been in place to uh, stuff colleges and universities with right wingers who share the ruling dispensations world view uh, history books are now being in fact i don't know if you have read this but history books are now being purged of references to muslim rulers altogether that mughal period you just mentioned earlier new history books will have no mention of the mughal period at all so mm-hmm. hindu supremacists are also 
working over time to penetrate mass culture, uh, like uh, particularly Bollywood, bogus drug busts, uh, tax raids, troll armies, etc., are being used to keep the industry in check. Concerted boycott campaigns are launched against Muslim stars, while outrage is uh, manufactured against films that offend the sensitivities of Hindu supremacists. So as a result, the Hindi film industry is a humanist and inclusive tales are slowly giving way to cinema laden with Islamophobic dog whistles. Now the thing is, now the question is whether the civil society is pushing back or not. Well, there have been civil society protests on and off, but there is a climate of fear because of the draconian security and sedition laws which the government uh, uses ruthlessly. The government has unfettered control of the security establishment. It's ruthless in the way it goes after those who it marks as enemies. You just saw what they did with Rahul Gandhi. Now think of what it can do to a small-time activist. And the judiciary has proven to be important in protecting you know, those prosecuted by the government. So there is this fear and it inhibits any large-scale pushback. I would say that the last time we witnessed large-scale civil society protests was in 2019, when demonstrations uh, broke out across India against a new citizenship law that discriminates against Muslims and a parallel initiative to start a nationwide citizen verification drive. The fear was that these measures would end up disenfranchising Muslims in large numbers. But that movement was brought to, uh, was brought to an end by a uh, BJP-led pogrom against Muslims in Delhi after the government managed to project this civil rights movement as a jihadi conspiracy. You know, it, it, it controls the media, so it controls the narrative, basically. And it stuffed the jails with movement leaders and whipped up religious hate, and, and that was the end of it. What about you? Some of your views on Prime Minister Modi, the BJP party, the state of Indian democracy or lack of democracy has been controversial, I would say, in the eyes of the BJP. Have, If you're able to share, have you faced any sort of pushback or uh, harassment from the government? So the, the book was published globally by Oxford University Press. And the idea was that a week after the launch of uh, the global launch of the book, uh, the book would be um, published in India, an Indian edition. Somehow the um, publisher suddenly developed cold feet. And we suspect it had a lot to do with uh, an article I had written at the time in the Time magazine blaming Modi for... Uh, not buying enough vaccines and and putting India and the world at risk. 30 to 40 lakh people, which is like uh, would be 3 to 4 million people uh, died in, in COVID in India, which is the highest. So I guess it had something to do with that. And there were uh, nasty pieces on me by uh, written in uh, the in a magazine which is the mouthpiece of the RSS, which is the umbrella body of the Hindu nationalist movement. Uh, BJP is uh, the political wing of RSS. And uh, so there was this article on me and how I am part of this international uh, conspiracy to defame Modi and Hindu phobic attempts to bring down the BJP government, etc. So we had to uh, take back the rights of the book and find a local publisher. We gave it to a different publisher uh, who then ran the, published the book six months later. I have been called a Chinese agent because I live in Hong Kong, of course. I must be working with the Chinese. I am also supposed to be working for... Uh, the Western conspirators who are trying to bring down India. (laughs) 
Well, let's turn to the United States. You segue nicely, actually. Part of the reason Modi has torn away at the seams of India's democracy is because he's acting with near absolute impunity in the international community. Both the Trump and Biden administrations have remained pretty silent as India's democracy erodes. And if you ask them, I think they would both argue or their administrations would argue that it's because the U.S. has a strategic objective to maintain its partnership with India as China gains more ground and influence around the South China Sea and broadly around the world. Do you buy that justification from the United States? Well, it's it's more an excuse than a justification, really. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, obviously that those or well, this geopolitical calculus is obviously one one rational for the U.S. to look away, but that is not the only one. Uh, India is also seen as this next big driver of the global economy, a giant market that offers unlimited opportunities to Western companies as it moves into its next phase of development. And and while the West and the China enter a phase of decoupling. So if you remember, uh, I don't know if you do, the day the Indian authorities raided the BBC office. Uh, they raided the BBC office after BBC showed a documentary on the 2002 riots in Gujarat. Uh, the day this happened, this uh, raid happened, we didn't uh, hear a peep from the UK government. The US government said something eventually like, uh, we are watching the situation, etc. But, um, you know, like there was nothing from the British Prime Minister. And I found it stunning that the British Broadcasting Corporation was being harassed in India for basically doing its job. And the British Prime Minister couldn't find it in himself to at least talk about it, if not condemn it altogether. But curiously enough, both Prime Minister Sunak and President Biden did make noises about India that day laudatory noises, that is, uh, after Air India announced a deal with Boeing and Airbus to buy a record 470 planes. That huge deal basically shut them up. And, uh, you know, as we say, uh, money talks. Now, uh, yeah, so there is that element of uh, attraction that also enables or at least um, removes any Western critic, Western government critic for Modi. That, that is very helpful, I guess, for this regime. I'm wondering if there is also an argument here to be made that offering Modi absolute impunity could actually be detrimental to the United States' long-term strategic objective. Yeah, so I, so I guess what... What you're asking is that could offering this kind of impunity to a strategic ally and, and a promising business partner be detrimental to America's strategic objective in the long term, right? Right. So, yeah, of course, yes, it is detrimental. As we know, many of American foreign policy decisions throughout history have been downright unethical and even bad for itself in the long run. But what I find problematic uh, with the whole, not just American, but the Western approach to Modi is not that it is cynically opportunistic. You know, one could argue that national interests may not always lead to ethical choices. But what I find really objectionable is justifying this opportunism as a noble cause in the service of a so-called global battle between democracy and autocracy making nice with uh, Modi by citing the cause of democracy is disingenuous and does not serve to improve the West's already dubious record of manipulative doublespeak. And this manipulative doublespeak was parroted recently, most recently in this Biden's uh, ridiculous uh, summit of democracy. The opening day of this summit this year, 
was uh, two addresses were given by guess who narendra modi and etinam and 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 like these are supposedly uh, the icons of democracy and they get invited to talk at this democracy summit and because because of this imagined war that biden is waging against china's autocracy i don't i don't see how any of this makes sense is ethical what would you suggest that the united states do or the west do india a country like india of course won't broach external intervention and neither should anybody try to intervene in india's matters this is a, a matter which india will have to sort out itself but so even if the west does not intervene or the least it it can do is legitimize a clearly dictatorial or semi dictatorial regime by calling it an icon of democracy it can clearly tell the government what it likes what it does not like uh, it can make its displeasure felt but i don't think none of this is done very clearly and you mentioned several actions taken by the modi administration and several laws passed by parliament you mentioned the raid at the bbc in india the anti muslim citizenship laws for those who are interested in india and indian politics who may not be getting a fix when they read american news sites what sorts of issues do you recommend we look forward to or watch that are now unfolding uh, whether they be laws that are being stalled in parliament that are about to pass or whether they be any sort of elections that are coming up that are really critical to india's future one of the uh, most dangerous policy changes initiated by the modi government in recent years was the uh, new citizenship law that discriminates against muslim refugees seeking citizenship in india linking citizenship with religion was the greatest subversion of india's secular constitution and it should have automatically been uh, a red flag for foreign governments as to the direction in which india is headed so the law predictably you know triggered nationwide protests which the government subdued by framing the movement as i was saying earlier by framing the movement as a jihadi plot and engineered a pogrom against muslims in delhi finally trump was visiting delhi at the time in 2020 and uh, he was attending state dinners uh, not far from where the mass violence was taking place i mean literally there while trump was having dinner there there were these live footages of uh, riots coming from northeastern delhi but the us government conveniently did not bother to raise the issue with the indian side at all so you know like these are you don't have to the us doesn't have to no one has to intervene but at least you can um, the the us can uh, make it stands very clear or can ask very clear questions of a country which it calls its partner there have been other very disturbing laws some uh, states ruled by modi's party have in recent years moved aggressively to institute laws against interfaith marriage and religious conversions you know like both both of these are gross uh, violation of the freedom of choice i don't think i have heard any american protestations on these uh i also don't think american policy makers pay much attention to the curbs on foreign funding for civil society and foreign ngos operating in in india ford foundation has um, been under a lot of pressure in Uh, in india food foundation funding for many ngos have shrunk after modi's government began to hound it amnesty international had to halt its india operations facing similar hostilities greenpeace has also had to shut some of its offices but um, the american or other western governments have not really pushed back against 
this very meaningfully which they could well have and they should because these actions uh, involve organizations rooted in their country so even if america even if it is not right for the american government to interfere in the laws that the indian legislature is passing at least the american government has the right to ask the indian government why organizations like the ford foundation are not being allowed to function freely in india that if you do not even have that much say in your uh, friends affairs then you might as well not be friends at all so so there are a lot of aspects in india which um, which are worth focusing on which are worth paying attention to but um, i haven't seen any strong american statements on these for example the i don't know if you have been keeping track of this this daily attacks on muslims which has started ever since the month of ramadan began uh, so the mosques are being vandalized there have been processions there have been riots pogroms attacks on muslim homes lynchings uh, oic yesterday issued a statement against this but um, this again complete silence from america on the rest of the west so these are things that uh, they should rightfully ask india about and they don't so you seem to suggest in your book that this is how india has always been at least post independence that poverty is rampant that many people are living with indignity so what makes this moment ripe for modi in other words at any point we would have seen a despot and it seems like indian society is ripe for despots so why is this moment unique so the reason for this sudden buzz is that this crisis of democracy is that these pathologies that i mentioned have substantially depend in the modi years modi comes from a political tradition that has open grievances with india's inclusive constitution a political tradition that believes that india should have been a hindu state rather than a secular state so his contempt for the constitutionally mandated institutions is unsurprising the capture of institutions is thus both radical and tinged with a divisive ideology which is singularly aimed at undermining the constitution you know like modi is not the first despot because of the imperfections of the indian democratic system so there have been big and small despots modi was a small despot as the chief minister of gujarat before he became this big despot but unlike other big and small despots in the past and in the present modi is ideologically committed to culture war against muslims and christians and he is backed by a 100 year old hindu supremacist organization with millions of members that is committed to establishing a hindu first order in india so this is what makes this current phase of indian politics so important you know we we might be headed to a point where india's secular constitution is either formally undone or de facto destroyed despite all of indian democracies in big problems over the decades this is this this crisis is uh, a wholly different level altogether democracy by definition protects the interests of the majority because it's a numbers game right but the true test of a democracy is is how it protects its minorities how its counter majoritarian institutions like the judiciary the media the bureaucracy uh, they manage to fend off the majoritarian impulses of the executive you know minorities have been targeted in the past in india there have been riots there have been pogroms there have been 
instances of discrimination, but never have the minorities faced the kind of existential threat they do now. So the stakes to protect and preserve Indian democracy have never been higher, except maybe the period between 1975 and 1977, when the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi declared a state of emergency and suspended fundamental rights and assumed dictatorial powers. So this is why many today are calling this phase under Modi a state of undeclared emergency. This is easily one of the most trying times of India's 75-year-old democracy. And the whole world should pay attention to what is going on here. Debashish Roy Chowdhury, thank you very much. Thank you, Seraphine. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get an ad-free version of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material Supporter at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath. Check out our written work as well at lawfareblog.com. This podcast is edited by Jen Pacha Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.